Hello, everybody. My name is Christine Pere. I'm uh, preparing with my colleagues today a short overview about the GeoPose specification and providing a status report for you in preparation for our March 24th meeting. So the way this is going to work um, is we are going to hear first from Jeremy Morley, one of the other co-chairs of the SWIG. We're going to hear from Jean-Eric Vinji of OpenAR Cloud, who's also, along with Jeremy and myself, a third co-chair. And then um, Steve Smith will be presenting about the implementation targets and the, the details of implementation as we've defined them. At the end, we'll be speaking to you about next steps and we, how you might participate and contribute to this um, important specification. Jeremy, are you ready? I am, thanks, Christine. So this is uh, Jeremy Morley. I'm uh, Chief Geospatial Scientist at Ordnance Survey. And yeah, my job here is to uh, just set the background for um, GeoPose. So in many ways, what the uh, problem statement uh, that we've been working on um, is relatively simple here. It's to be able to express, to capture and share, particularly uh, an object, whether it's a real or virtual object, its position and orientation in space with a uh, six degrees of freedom kind of representation so position orientation and pretty much as usual uh, for a standard our idea is to save um, effort and save tasking and having to redesign and redevelop different uh, frameworks for sharing this information between different uh, systems and, and software next slide please um, and particularly, we're interested then in things like the frames of reference. Okay, so if if we're trying to share um, data between, say, a local um, BIM model frame, um, a view, VR viewpoint framework, and a global geospatial framework, how do we share that position and orientation between those different uh, local frames of reference? Next, please. So our requirement then is this standardized and we hope eventually adopted expression of the position orientation. Um, that's the overall requirement. Uh, Nick, as it says here, can be a real or digital uh, object and uh, an observer. And the conceptual thing then is that we want to represent this in a, in a data model that represents um, this position and rotation relative to a frame of reference a frame of reference that is anchored back to uh, the real world, to a geospatial uh, framework. Um, and the implementations we'll uh, come on to later in this talk, uh, the encodings, you know, how do we actually encode the position and orientation um, in a clearly defined data structure? Next, please. So what is a pose? Um, here in this uh, diagram that you, you see in this uh, presentation, you see um, a couple of different objects. You see a person here holding some sort of uh, VR tablet device looking towards the robot with a manipulator uh, hand at the end of its uh, end of its arm. And what we want to be able to relate together ultimately is the viewpoint of the, the tablet that's actually looking at this, uh, this robot uh, in action. And ultimately we have a couple of different poses that are particularly important to us. We have the pose of the tablet that is looking out into the world and ultimately we have the manipulator arm or the manipulator hand itself at the end of the arm and where that is in space and uh, what's it ori its orientation. And these things are linked through a series of, of frames of reference. Uh, maybe if we start with the tablet we have the frame of reference of the uh, of the tablet that is related through the person's arms to the person uh, themselves and then, then down to where they're standing in a local uh, plane of reference and from that to the big axes in the middle to the origin of the of that kind of local coordinate uh, frame and then from that local coordinate frame we move over to the the rover and up through the arms of the rover and their different orientations all the way to that manipulator hand and that's the the link between those two poses that links them together between the frames of references that that chain of frames of reference next please and ultimately while in that previous description this is all linked through some local cartesian plane 
ultimately, if we're going to bring in information from the rest of the world and say linked to a uh, 3D GIS database or, or something like that, we ultimately want to reference back to the Earth and an Earth coordinate system, a, ge a full geospatial frame of reference. And that's kind of makes it a, a geopose instead of just a, a pose. Next, please. Okay, so the pose then is the basic thing that captures a, a location and orientation. Next, please. And that, as I've just been discussing with that example of the uh, person holding the, the uh, tablet device and the and the manipulator arm of the uh, robot system, um, we link this together through a series of uh, transformation chains that relates poses uh, together, and it's this series of frames of reference that we're interested in in that, in that chain. Next, please. Then finally, somewhere along that line, in the original example, it was with the, the Cartesian plane. We need some uh, fr outermost frame, which is the uh, kind of fixed outermost uh, frame of reference that defines the world in which all of these, these frames exist. Next, please. Um, and preferentially in this uh, in the system we're talking about, we want that fixed pose actually to be related to the Earth system um, itself. That ephemeris object that we're referring to is the is the Earth itself, and that makes it top top eccentric reference and a geopose as opposed to a, a fixed pose. So the short version: a geopose ties location and orientation of a spatial object to the either the Earth surface or uh, some other reference surface of the of the Earth itself. Next, please. So what we're interested in in this GeoPose standard is a data model to do this thing of encoding to represent the, um, the location and the orientation to allow it to be shared between, um, between systems, okay? Data model. What we're not interested in is how we obtain um, these uh, positions and orientations. It's not in itself a substitute for the camera sensor model. You know, it's a simple representation of the orientation. And we're not defining the means of access to the, the pose either. So it's not an API or a library. It is a data model. Next, please. Okay, and great. I think that's thank the end of my bit. So thank you so much, Jeremy, for that great introduction. One thing is to, to specify a standard, but it's uh, also essential to look uh, for the kind of use cases where this kind of standard can be valuable. Next slide. Uh, this is a very generic fundamental standard that can apply to more or less any industry or use case that that has some sort of interaction with the real world. I'm going to look uh, into three specific ones that are we think are um, going to be some of the use cases where this is in most high demand in the, the early phase. Next slide. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on around autonomous vehicles and robotics. Uh, and one of the challenges that they need to solve uh, is to coordinate this dynamic situation where you have moving objects things that are detected in real time, and to be able to communicate between uh, the different uh, vehicles or robots in a dynamic shared world. So Geopost can uh, be highly useful for different kinds of systems that are uh, dynamic uh, in, um, in the real world, where you want to, uh, for each of the the actors for each of the robots or the cars to be provided with the situational awareness of both the position and orientation of all the other entities that are relevant. We definitely think that this can alleviate the design and uh, development of such systems in the future. So one, one obvious thing is to for having one system detecting an obstacle in real time and then sharing uh, geopost information about that obstacle to to other systems and interoperability really can save lives um, in this in this kind of use case um, for um, 
for other uh, industries like the construction architecture sector things are not so dynamic uh, it's it's more um, a situation where you want to anchor data to the real world with more accuracy uh, and you want to anchor not not a just a a, a coordinate but also the position of the whole data set so that might be a BIM model, it might be an architectural visualization, it might be infrastructure under the ground. And um, the, the key thing here is that you communicate between all these different systems that are used in this industry in a seamless way by expressing the position orientations of all, all these data sets between, between them. Next slide. From my perspective, from coming from AR cloud technology, uh, this is sort of um, uh, a future vision where where uh, the physical world around you is enhanced with a layer of information that you get access to through AR, through augmented reality interactions. So these things uh, now uh, are not just sporadic uh, experiences. Uh, that goes away. These things can now be, using this technology, be anchored to the real world as part of the real world, displayed uh, and interacted with, not only by one person but everyone. So you you have the persistence of of uh, information in the real world. Uh, now uh, three dimensional information, not just coordinates, but the the full uh, full six degrees of freedom position and orientation of that of that 3D information. And it will be viewable by by many people at the same time. Um, so um, one one important aspect here is to to have your GVice geopose as well as the geopose of all the content. And next slide. So in uh, <clears throat> general we aim to uh, achieve benefits across different services, different products, different industries. Uh, and this is important because without that, you know, there's no, in, there's no agreement on semantics and naming uh, and data types and encodings uh, um, or frames of reference. All these things, if left on their own, to their own devices, people will implement them in in ways that are very hard to to um, work between. You have to do individual uh, adaptation and implementations to connect two systems. Now we solve this for for all this industry in one big go by by agreeing on the semantics and namings, the data types, and the frames of reference. We think this this will be tremendously valuable going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jean Eric, and um, that's that's great. Now we are able to um, we're going to be hearing from our um, architect uh, Steve Smith, who has been working with us to make uh, make the GeoPose standard readable and reflect the agreement of the SWIG members. Steve, are you able to share your screen with us and? talk to us about the um, the implementation targets. We see your screen. Steve, we're not hearing you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, GeoPost defines um, eight standardization targets. Each one of these is a data object and these data objects are oriented toward um, one or more use cases. The standardization targets are independent. That means that implementers uh, need only implement uh, targets, a target or targets that apply to uh, their application. And anything else is, um, that's irrelevant to the application, doesn't have to be considered. The specification of the targets is broken into two parts. 
uh, the structure of the target. It's a implementation neutral definition of the the data content and the data structure, the interpretation of the the data. Uh, plus encoding, so it's how it's written, how it's serialized, um, how it actually appears when you receive it. Uh, the reason for breaking it into structure and encoding uh, is so that different encodings um, can be developed and used as required. We chose JSON for the first encoding because it's web-friendly and widely used. And the availability of JSON schema allows automated testing and implementation. Now I'll go through the eight um, targets one at a time. I'll give a brief overview. The first is the basic GeoPose. It's intended to be simple and concise. Uh, no options, and it should satisfy uh, most use case requirements. The advanced GeoPose is, supports more complex use cases uh, where more flexibility and or uh, time tagging is required. And the three uh, composite uh, groups of standardization targets, the chain, the graph, and the sequence um, are um, definitions of groupings of components of geoposes that target specific application areas. Basic um, it's intended to be simple but widely applicable. It uses a single um, fixed outer reference frame. It's a, a local tangent plane, a plane that's tangent to the ellipsoid, the approximation to the sea level surface of the Earth at a particular point and uh, defines a local east, north, and up uh, rectangular Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, it's possible to use uh, Euler angles to define orientation or to use a quaternion to define orientation. The advanced uh, GeoPose allows a choice of reference frames, really a very wide choice of reference frames, including ones that are non-terrestrial. And it's also possible to apply a timestamp to an advanced GeoPose. The composite uh, Geoposes are, uh, again, three kinds of structures, sequences, which are really time series, either time series equally spaced in time or uh, randomly spaced in time, uh, either known in advance, which are the series, or uh, delivered in real time uh, in a continuous stream. Chains are, as in the explanation of the robot arm uh, pose uh, directed non-branching link transformations between different reference frames. Graph uh, geopose graphs are uh, multiply link transformations um, represented by a directed acyclic graph. Basic uh, geopose um, is defined here in, in more detail. The or, or um, boxes um, describe the structure. So there's a local tangent plane, earth north up frame, and the specification of orientation either is oil angles or quaternion. And to define the local tangent plane, you need uh, a latitude, a longitude, and a height above the ellipsoid. So this is an example of a basic um, geopose using a quaternion for orientation. It's a view outward from the city hall in Oslo. The advanced, um, again, 
differs from the basic by allowing definition of different kinds of reference frames, not just local tangent plane earth east north up, as well as adding a time. Chains um, allow a range of reference frames and the linkage in linear fashion from one reference frame to another. So from the base of the robot arm to the manipulator at the end. Here's an example of an actual data object um, specifying a view backwards toward the Oslo City Hall. A graph um, application is for connected, multiply branching uh, frames of reference. An example in the lower right here is a, um, a human figure with um, representations which could be used as, as I say bones in an animation to define the location and orientation of various uh, parts of a human body. The graph representation can be applied to the same case of the Oslo City Hall. The sequence, all the sequences are, are time series, and they're really the difference between um, the series and the stream is that the series is packaged uh, for the total number of geoposes is, is known in advance, and um, it's possible to have them. Uh, equally spaced in time or um, at random, but advancing points in time. So a regular series and an irregular series. Stream is open-ended where you um, know the beginning frame of reference, and then you get a sequence of inner frames, the, the transformation, that's the location orientation in the geopose with time. Again, this was noted before, but I'll just emphasize it again, that the GeoPost specification only defines the data objects to be transported in the stream. There's, there's no definition of an API or transport mechanism, and those transport mechanisms and other uh, technology are responsible outside the scope of GeoPose for uh, delivering the content and ensuring its integrity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate your explaining those uh, to us and very, very important details of how we've structured this and how we um, make it available to to the implementers, to the to the developers, and other companies that are going to be using GeoPose going forward. So I'd now like to just remind folks um, a little bit of our status and how you can get um, get more information. So the um, in the middle of February. We published the draft specification up on uh, GitHub. Uh, it's just a easy to find, intuitive URL. Um, and we are really um, looking forward to having the OGC communities and the, the wider community of, of potential adopters um, review the specification and provide us inputs and feedback. Uh, if you you get to the specification and you do have uh, some comments or something you'd like to contribute, please start by looking at the open issues. We're actively working on those. If it's um, a new topic, then just open a new issue and we will we'll be able to review that during our SWIG meetings and um, then come back and, and address, uh, address those open issues. I just want to invite everybody who are, um, may have an opportunity and the time during our next member meeting 
to join us on March 24th. That's Wednesday, March 24th from 9 a.m. to 10.30 uh, Eastern Time to participate in the, uh, the SWIG meeting. And in lieu of uh, going through and sharing the information we have today, we'll just have a very, very brief report, status update, and then head on to the important topics on our agenda. Thank you very much for your attention, and we look forward to uh, your participation on March 24th. Bye now. <laughs>